So absolutism is a big part of what we're looking at in chapter 15. And Henry IV, who we studied in our last unit, was really critical in laying the groundwork in France for that more centralized and moving closer to absolutist uh, rule. Remember that he also was a Huguenot who converted to Catholicism, created the Edict of Non, but he also did. He built up the army, he survived 16 assassination attempts before they finally killed him. Uh, so, uh, he does a lot to really build the country. Uh, his son is Louis XIII. Uh, we will never see another French king that doesn't have the name Louis until about 1824, maybe? So we get several Louis, um, which is, of course, wonderful. Um, your time, like the timeline of our class, which goes into the 1700s, into the Enlightenment, definitely gets to Louis XV, but your book never really did, I don't even remember him them mentioning Louis XV much. Uh, and that's kind of normal how I've dealt with him. I've usually done him as background for the next unit. So Louis XV often gets kind of lost in the shuffle between Louis XIV and Louis XVI. Um, and notice he's not on the board. He's definitely not on the tab. Um, if you know something about Louis XV, I'm good. Um, so, Louis XIII is, a, is really the first French king of this kind of time period because we kind of dealt with Henry IV before. He is moving, he's closer to absolutism, um, but really the most important things that happened during his time period are decisions made by Richelieu, his advisor. Richelieu is his main minister, and he's really content to let Richelieu make the decisions. And so if, when you study the history of this time period, the emphasis is often on Richelieu, understandably, and it was in your text as well, because Richelieu had a huge part to play in really shaping the French kingdom, the French monarchy, and continuing that consolidation, that control into the hands of the king. Um, Richelieu will continue to build up the military, um, on, continues the use of entendants. Okay, remember that entendants were um, royal officials. They went out and countryside and did things for the king, but the local nobles had no authority over them. Okay? They are only with the royals, are uh, only with the crown, really. And so that was an important development. Um, Rishu is going to weaken the Edict of Nantes. He takes out some of the protections in the Edict of Nantes, um, but he doesn't get rid of it completely. Um, but it's mostly, it's not really about the religion, it's mostly about the political ramifications that he sees. He wants to strengthen the king. So even though he's a, I mean, he's a Catholic cardinal, um, he's really doing it for political reasons. Um, when Louis XIII finally dies, um, Louis XIV, who I believe is Louis XIII's grandson, um, Louis XIV is only five when he officially becomes king of France. So. Uh, they don't let five-year-olds rule countries, which is good. And so instead, they need a regent. So who's his regent? Who's his regent? It's on the board. Who's his regent? Mazarin. There you go. Okay. Um, so Mazarin, also a cardinal. Um, Mazarin is the one that makes the decisions, um, because Louis is a child. So he, and interestingly, like his predecessor Richelieu, he continues to centralize the power. He's continuing the path to absolutism. And so that's one of the things that's interesting about France, is the French monarchy is becoming more absolutist, but it's largely these two cardinals that are pushing for it. Um, as Mazarin continues to do this, People are going to get upset. Who's most likely to be upset that the king is getting more and more power? Nobles. So what do the nobles of France do? They rebel. What's it called? The Fron. Very good. Fron. F-R-O-N-D. He's there. You just don't say it. Fron. And so the Fron is the, it's about four or five years where the nobles have kind of risen up. Unfortunately for them, they don't really make anything out of it. 
Uh, but Louie's mom took Louie out of the city because they were worried about his safety. Um, and this remained with Louie for the rest of his life. And he remembered that. And he wanted to make sure he never had to deal with those issues again. And so he is going to actively, actively be motivated by that. And that's part of what shapes what he does once he sees his power. Um, and when he comes back, he says, okay, I'm the king now. Okay, Mazarin is not ruling for me. I, I think he kind of waits for Mazarin's death to do that, but um, a little fuzzy on that. You really probably don't need to know. Now, on your website, on the Haiku site, there is a document that I have continually not had time for. And that happens. Um, it's called uh, Louis XIV and like 20, 20 million Frenchmen or something. And it's mostly demographics, which is social history. So I'm thinking what I'm going to do is even though we will, in the next unit, be well beyond Louis XIV, I'm, that demographic information is probably still important. And our next unit has lots of social history in it. Oh, and media has an answer to your question from Friday. So it's in chapter 17. Your contraception question. So, um, and not too far in, I think. Um, so, if you want to access that, it's only about six or seven pages um, in a smaller book that were just scanned and, and there. And it could some good demographic information for what it was like to live in France for a common person during Louis XIV's time period. Um, and so it's, it's, it's good stuff. Um, but this unit ends up being mostly political and intellectual. We don't get as much social history here. The next chapter is still kind of in the same time period. The next two chapters really heavily, heavily social history. So just be prepared for that. Um, Louis XIV, of course, fights a whole bunch of wars. Um, he builds Versailles. He is the Sun King. He's probably the single best example of absolute monarchy there is. He, he, you could make a case for anyone. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, oh, I think Peter the Great is a better example. Okay, fine. But he's the one that often people point to as the best example of absolutism. Um, remember, though, that he's not ruling on his own. He does need help. And so he has ministers. 